Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. Today we are looking at someone who is debatably France's most famous drug smuggler and also someone who played a key role in the history of the Malaysian judicial system, as the first foreigner sentenced to death for drug trafficking in Malaysia in 1982, Bitka Sobin. And also I don't speak French and my pronunciation throughout all of this video will be absolute rubbish. Now I should point out that many questions remain over the culpability of Sorbin and if she did indeed intend to traffic drugs out of Malaysia into Europe. Much of what we know regarding her plight was influenced by political and public opinion particularly in France in the 1980s, as well as her autobiographies Le Prive and Quand la Porte s'ouvrir. Inevitably, a thorough investigation was never carried out to discover her true culpability by Malaysian or French authorities, and it is not known if she was an innocent mule coerced by a man who said he loved her, or an actual drug trafficker. Personally, having read Le Prive, I believe that she was innocent and that she is telling the truth, and was indeed a vulnerable young woman coerced by a man who she thought she was going to marry. So if you feel that I am being biased, well, that is why. But with a failed drug smuggling operation having taken place over 40 years ago, we may never know the true story of Sorbin, and ultimately you are free to make your own decisions and form your own views as to her guilt. Sorbin was born Beatrice Sylvier Marguerite Sorbin on the 7th of September 1959 in Troyes, France, the capital of Aubert, in the Grand East region of North Central France. She was the byproduct of her mother, Josette, a prostitute, and a soldier named Sylvestre Sorbin. Her mother gave her to her grandmother, Moriette, who raised her in Romilie sur CNR. The newspaper Le Point would describe her as a dirty, unloved kid. She had one sister, Nicole. She began hanging out with a bad crowd and smoking weed regularly with her friends in her teens. She also began to run away from home. Her grandmother didn't even bother to sign her up for her last years of high school and she dropped out of high school at the age of 16. Moving to Paris, she began offering sexual favours for money to the children of a Saudi emir as well as other rich clients and she moved in with a rich boyfriend who she despised. She then began hitchhiking around Europe and the Middle East, ending up in Beirut, Lebanon. Sometimes she would hitchhike with a girlfriend and sometimes she would hitchhike alone despite being aged just 16, desperate to leave Romali and her overly possessive grandmother behind. She then travelled to Pakistan and Thailand and became engaged to a Thai man named Dom. However, she ran out of money and returned to France where she worked as a secretary. She then returned to Thailand in 1979 but was unable to find Dom who had bailed. Sorbin then sunk into depression and travelled to Malaysia where she met a Malaysian man named Eddie Tan Kim Su. In Penang, the two would stay at the Eastern and Oriental Hotel, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and debatably Penang's most famous hotel, which opened in 1885. Famous guests have ranged from playwright and old coward to the Sultan of Brunei, Hassanal Bolkai to Japan's 124th Emperor Hirohito, to Pol Pot, to Kim Il-sung, to Charlie Chaplin. The pair would stay in the hotel for a month in late 1979 and early 1980, where they would have a sexual relationship. Sorbin, now aged just 20, would describe this as the most magical period of her life, and Tan proposed to her, promising that they would marry in Zurich, Switzerland. On the 27th of January 1980, she was given a suitcase by Tan, a green Samsonite bag, and told to take it from Penang International Airport through Singapore to Zurich, Switzerland. However, Tan would not be on her flight and would get a different flight. As you'll know, if you've seen any of my videos on the execution of Australian citizens Kevin Barlow and Brian Jeffrey Chambers, Penang International Airport has X-ray scanners at the entry to the airport, which are prior to check-in. 
Stopped at the x-ray scanners, Sorbin was immediately taken into a separate room and it was found that in the lining of her Samsonite suitcase was 534 grams of pure grade heroin with a street value of over 300,000 Malaysian ringgit or 500,000 US dollars. The heroin was inside 22 plastic packets of light brown paper. Sorbin insisted that she had never seen heroin and that Tan had put the heroin inside the suitcase, however Malaysian police were unable to locate him. In reality she had been under surveillance while in Penang according to the New York Times. In 1976, Malaysia strengthened its drug laws whereby a person possessing more than 100 grams of heroin or morphine was presumed unless the contrary was proven to be trafficking with the penalty being either death or life imprisonment. A trafficker who escapes the death penalty according to the law would also be liable to whipping, but would usually be eligible for parole after 14 years. In essence, and uniquely for Malaysia today, the judge have the discretion to give life imprisonment. The change in Malaysian legislation in 1976 came to pass following a rise in drug trafficking for Malaysia, particularly Penang, with the law minister, Sri Abdul Qadir Din Yusuf, reporting that as of November 1976, Malaysia had 20 cases of drug trafficking, including one smuggling 14 kilograms of heroin out of Malaysia, worth 4.3 million US dollars, prompting Malaysia to bring in a harsher sentence. This was replaced in 1983 by the Dangerous Drugs Act Section 39B which made the death sentence mandatory for those in possession of just 15 grams or more of heroin or morphine as it would be presumed that these individuals had the drugs for the purpose of trafficking. This took away the judge's discretion for life imprisonment. During her initial hearing, the prosecutor claimed that she was planning on selling the heroin in France. Sorbin claimed that she didn't have any knowledge of the drugs and that Tan had put the drugs inside her Samsonite suitcase. However, the judge doubted the existence of Tan. She was represented by Dato K. Kumarandran. She did not plead guilty even though this could have qualified her for an automatic life sentence with 30 drug traffickers, all Malays, having received the death sentence since 1977 for drug trafficking. Ironically, it was in the midst of her imprisonment and trial that France abolished capital punishment on the 9th of October 1981. However, the last person executed in France was Hamida Danjan Dubir, who was executed on the 10th of September 1977 by guillotine. On the 17th of June 1982 at the Penang High Court, Justice Datuk Bigli Li Tian Huat sentenced Sorbin to death by hanging and she became the first foreigner subjected to the death penalty in Malaysia for drug trafficking. Returned to her cell and to death row, she wept and protested her innocence to the awaiting media. Justice Huat was unimpressed with her defence and would state it must be made known to all persons who contemplate this sort of crime that the punishment, if they are caught, is invariably severe. It must be shown conclusively that it does not pay. She was placed in solitary confinement on death row until her appeal was heard, which would be two months. She struggled to adjust in prison and would throw fits and tantrums and was insulted by Chinese, Indian and Malay prisoners. She also couldn't muster up the courage to write to her grandmother. While on death row, she became addicted to tranquilizers, which helped her sleep to fight her depression. However, her addiction led to her spending time in the psychiatric ward of Penang Hospital, as she was wheezed off the tranquilizers. However, it was while on death row that her case became infamous in both France and Malaysia, with her grandmother flying to be with Sorbin and she had not seen her grandmother since she was 16. Moreover, many locals in Malaysia, as well as people in France, believe that Sorbin was innocent and that she did not deserve a death penalty. In an interview with the New York Times, a local insurance executive stated, she must have been used. I can't believe she was the big money behind it. The individual also stated that many more were more guilty than her. While on death row, she was visited by Catholic priest Father Jean Tavernek, who would tell the New York Times, behind her are many people more guilty than she. 
The case also gained a strong interest in France with Le Journal du Dimanche launching a petition calling for her release. Some of France's most famous celebrities would sign that petition, and as Le Point would note in 1995, no one is missing. This included poet Louis Aragon, philosopher Raymond Aron, then member of the National Assembly for Israel's fourth constituency, and future permanent representative of France to UNESCO, Gilesse Halimi, singer Johnny Halliday, actor Gerard Depardieu, actor Lieves Montand, writer Jean Domesson, and singer Enrico Macias. One of her most prominent supporters was Paul Lombard, the then general counsellor of the canton of Martigues and the mayor of Martigues. Indeed, during her appeal, lawyer Karen Beredet, an associate of Paul Lombard, became involved in Sorbin's case. During her time in prison, Sorbin ultimately became a celebrity. However, the French government refused to intervene in domestic Malaysian law until all avenues of appeal were conducted. Following her sentence to death, Comendran would launch an appeal. On the 25th of August 1982, the Malaysian High Court in Kuala Lumpur would hear Sorbin's appeal and commuted her sentence to life in prison, but the court insisted that the decision did not act as a precedence. Indeed, Justice Sufian, during her appeal, would state, We would not like this case to be a precedent for other cases, but in this case we feel it is right to reduce the sentence to life. Sorbin would tell the media on the 27th of September 1982, her 23rd birthday, They wanted to make an example of me because I'm white and they say I'm pretty. I was very upset. Indeed, an attempt to utilise Sorbin's appeal to act as a precedence during a case in 1984 for drug trafficking was rejected and in that case the death penalty remained. Indeed, Barbara Barlow, the mother of Kevin Barlow, would cite the case of Sorbin in a desperate attempt to have her son saved from the death penalty, as well as citing the case in 1987 in an interview with Fairfax Media regarding the plight of British drug smuggler Derek Gregory. However, both men were hanged in 1986 and 1989 respectively, and as a result Sorbin's case was never to act as a precedence. However, Komenandran would state that with time served and with good conduct, it was hoped that Sorbin would be out of jail within 11 years. Sorbin enjoyed something of a celebrity status while in prison and received special privileges, including a 10 by 10 foot or 3 meter by 3 meter cell all to herself. This was a privilege for most in Malaysian prisons, as most shared their cells with four other prisoners in a cell that was only 2 by 3 meters. She also had her own mattress, reading material, a tape recorder with tapes, cigarettes, and fostered a strong relationship with fellow prisoners and guards. French writer Didier de Coyenne visited her in prison and in 1984 wrote the book Beatrice en Enfer, blaming her conviction on a judicial error. While in prison, she became fluent in Malay and Cantonese. Indeed, New Zealand journalist Tim Donoghue described her as a generally model prisoner. In 1987, she started working in the prison hospital, which was a pretty high gig for a Malaysian prisoner. By her own confession, during this time she saved women from diseases, and also saw the horror that drugs could do. She even began attending dinner parties at the French Embassy, and teaching aerobics to officers' wives three times a week, utilising a boombox and tapes provided from the prison. In 1990, she was released from prison for good conduct, wearing a chador to avoid attracting attention from the French media when leaving prison. By this stage, she was well and truly one of the lucky ones. Malaysia had executed 70 people by this stage for drug trafficking, including Westerners, and it really didn't give a damn what passport you held, with a combined 36 foreigners having been executed in Malaysia for drug trafficking. Flying via Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, she returned to Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport, back on French soil for the first time in 11 years, returning in a green jacket and sunglasses to a flurry of media attention. But Sorbin always knew that her adjustment back into French society would not be easy. She would state to the media in 1982, 
When am I out? I'll have to return to France, at least for a time. I'll have to change my name, of course. I mean, who'd employ a convicted drug smuggler? She moved into a large apartment in the 10th arrondissement of Paris. In 1991, she published the book Le Prive, translating to My Ordeal, with the book published in English as My Ordeal, 10 Years in a Malaysian Prison, and released in 1994 in English. It was later released in German under the title Dieser Hunger nach Lieben. The book won the Prix Verité Literary Award in 1991 and sold 170,000 copies in its first year. In 1995, she published her second book, Quand la porte s'ouvre, When the Door Opens, detailing her freedom and life following her release from prison. However, only 25,000 copies of this book were printed. It was during this time that she became something of a celebrity in France, appearing on Sacré Sorrière in 1991, a variety TV show broadcast on TF1 from 1987 to 1984 and then from 2007 to 2009, as well as Count show Ex Libris in 1994 and Vincent Olorère in 1995. However, life outside of prison for Sorbin was not all that rosy as she had predicted. Surviving on a disability pension, she developed anorexia. She also had a hard time adjusting with tremors in her knees which were caused by weakness from squatting in prison and her teeth had been decalcified while she was in prison. She eventually turned to alcoholism and had to sell her flat, moving into a studio. While out of prison, her grandmother, father and mother would all pass away. In essence, she had nobody. She began to suffer from depression and was put under curatorship. She eventually stopped drinking excessively, but still ate very little because of her anorexia. Only foie gras and salmon and a cocktail. By 2007, she weighed less than 40 kilograms, and in October 2007, she called her friends Frédéric and Sylvie for desperate help. On the 31st of October 2007, her guardian, Annie, visited her, and Sorbin said that while in prison there was a lot of noise, and she noted that she was suffering from the silence. This was despite having been a free woman and out of prison for 17 years. On the 2nd of November 2007, she died of heart failure and was buried near her mother's grave in Villemnière. Le Journal de Démonche in the memoriam to Sorbin would ask one question. Was she innocent? They noted that around her no one was fooled and she never talked about her Malaysian ordeal after her books were published. Indeed, she used to simply say whenever anybody asked about her time in Malaysia or if she was guilty, as long as President Chirac is alive, I will say nothing. Jacques Chirac would outlive Sorbin and passed away in 2019. Thank you for watching. Please do yourself a favour and hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to be informed of when new videos come out. Also, why not hit that like button and leave a nice comment? It helps more than you know and your support is truly appreciated. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet, have an amazing day. And remember, the truth is always more interesting than fuction.